Welcome to Brain and Event. We're delighted to be rejoined by Justin Garçon. In our last episode, we spoke about madness, and today we're going to be speaking about the evolution of the mind. Justin's very well-renowned book is in its second edition. It's called The Biological Mind, A Philosophical Introduction. Justin, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Sure. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that there is actually two different people who came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. First, you have Charles Darwin, of course, who we all know and love. But then there's another guy named Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace and Darwin knew each other. They actually presented these ideas at the same conference. So you wonder, why don't we all know who Wallace is? And there's a lot of reasons for that. But one reason is that Wallace began to distance himself from the theory later in life. And in fact, he wrote this 500 page book on evolution and he called it Darwinism. Do so you think, well, wh why did this guy want to distance himself from his own theory? And part of it was this, Darwin's point of view was this theory of evolution by natural selection works so well when we're trying to understand our bodies, how the eye is so well designed for seeing how that hands and fingers are so well adapted for grasping things, I bet it works equally well for thinking about the mind. Probably can help us understand, for example, why people universally are disgusted by you know, the smell of rotting meat, why it is that people uh, are much more generous toward their own children than to other people's children. So he was very eager to develop the implications uh, of his theory for the mind. Wallace, on the other hand, didn't want to have anything to do with that. Wallace's point of view was that, look, evolution by natural selection explains the body and has absolutely nothing uh, to say about the mind. And that's because in his view, the mind was a product of uh, what he called the spirit. And it seems to me that this basic schism runs so deep in academia today, it's really hard to understand almost anything about the conversation taking place about evolutionary psychology without understanding this split. On the one hand, you have a group of people, I call the neo-Darwinians, like myself, who say, this theory works so great for understanding the body, I bet it works equally well for understanding the mind. I mean, the mind is a natural phenomenon. And then you have the neo-Wallisians who say, again, this theory works great for the body, it doesn't apply to the mind. And by the way, don't apply it to the mind. It's a bad thing to, to do that. And the neo Wallisians are a very diverse bunch. On the one hand, you have people who are very socially conservative, like a lot of Catholics. Evolution is great for the body. It doesn't work for explaining the mind. On the other hand, some neo Wallisians are very socially progressive. And for some reason, they've latched on to this idea that pretty much everything interesting about the human mind is a product of culture, socialization, and upbringing. And often too, there's this kind of moralistic overtone, like, well, as soon as you start dragging evolution into thinking about the mind, you're going to start promoting racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, eugenics. So just don't do that anymore. So I, I think this whole conversation about evolutionary psychology has a lot of very rich scientific, political, philosophical, social dimensions. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. So I'm very curious about two things. The first is why would applying evolutionary theory to psychology engender or encourage racism or homophobia? That's very, very curious to me. Homophobia, I can kind of understand because the view generally is that people reproduce from an evolutionary perspective or people have sex to reproduce. And so gay people don't fit into that mold. So you might see some sort of homophobic bent there, but that's more an action-based account of what homosexuality is rather than a psychological account. So I'm curious about why homophobia or racism would enter the equation if you applied evolutionary psychology to people's minds. Okay, good. So, wow, you're, <laughs> you're jumping right into some of the most controversial parts of evolutionary psychology. So let me say something about racism, because there are some evolutionary psychologists who are interested in studying potential evolutionary aspects of racism. 
And it's interesting. I've, I've actually heard two big name philosophers of race who have effectively said, as far as I'm concerned, if you think that there's any evolutionary foundation to racism, then I'm not even talking to you. Like you're, you're not one of my interlocutors. You're not somebody I'm going to engage with. If I have the chance to, I'm going to silence you, marginalize you, uh, push you to the fringe. So you think, well, why is this such a awful thing to think about? And I think I understand why often if I say, I think there is an evolutionary explanation for racism, what people hear is we're designed to be racist and nothing is ever going to change that. But that is absolutely not the evolutionary psychology approach to racism. When evolutionary psychologists look at racism, the basic framework that they use is the following. Our minds are designed in such a way that there are certain kinds of social, environmental, contextual cues that will tend to trigger racist thinking. It's not that the mind designed to be racist, that wouldn't even make sense. It's that the mind is designed in such a way that there are certain social, contextual, environmental cues that will tend to trigger racist thinking. But if that's true, then I think your reaction should be, well, let's try to figure out exactly what those are. If we're serious about fighting racism, we have to have all of our options on uh, the table. So let me just describe this one particular theory because I, I think it illustrates it well. It's called the coalitional theory of racism. And the basic idea is this, our minds are designed to detect coalitions in our environment. Groups of people who work together closely to achieve common goals. A labor union is a coalition. Greenpeace uh, is a coalition. Maybe even sports fans, Manchester fans, that's a coalition. And the idea is that two things happen when we see somebody is belonging to a coalition. First, we apply this sharp in-group, out-group thinking. Well, I'm not part of that group. I'm part of this other group. Two, we tend to explain their actions and behavior in terms of their coalition membership. Well, yeah, of course he's doing that because he's a Manchester fan. Now think about what would happen if you were growing up in a society where, uh, say, Jews are presented as forming a coalition, a group of people working together to achieve common interests. According to this theory, that's going to trigger A, this very sharp in-group, out-group mentality and B, a tendency to explain people's behavior in terms of their being Jewish. Well, yeah, of course, Allison thinks that way about Israel because she's a Jew and that's how Jews think about it. Take it one step further. Imagine that the media depicts black Americans or Korean Americans as constituting the coalition. According to this evolutionary theory, you're really setting the stage for, for dangerous thinking. I don't know if this theory is true or not. I think it's worth exploring in more detail. And if it is true, or if it's even in the neighborhood of truth, I think it's really vital uh, that we find out more about it. And I'm happy to talk more, uh, perhaps later on about sexual orientation and evolutionary approaches to that. So what's interesting about your response, it seems that you could have evolved a particular response, which is useful in a particular environment, right? So if we evolved many thousands of years ago and you've got small groups of people that need to survive, it's useful for them to have a way of determining who's a threat and who's an insider who you can trust. And as you say, that could be done without reference to race at all in that environment. You've, but you've developed some way of working out who insiders and outsiders are, and that can be biological. But there's a social element to it, which is who do we identify as insiders and outsiders? And as you say, you could have a lot of social views or media views, which say, well, that's done on the grounds of race. And so when the two intersect, you wind up with racism. And it seems that one way to then confront the reality of in-group, out-group evolved behavior isn't to deny the fact of that, it's to combat the social, which is instead of seeing different racial groups as other or as threats, rather to deny that bit, which is to say, well, actually there's a, there's a commonness among people of different uh, racial groups. One of the things that you deal with in the book, and you deal with it so well, is questions around whether races exist at all. And you look at a number of different accounts. Could you tell us more about that? Oh, whether races exist at all. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a much bigger topic, but I can say a little bit about it. So one standard point of view since the 1970s, this was largely due to the uh, biologist Richard Lewinton. He said, look, races are social constructs. There's absolutely no biological foundation uh, for race. There's just as much genetic diversity within any so-called races. Between the so-called races, there's even uh, more of it. And that was a very standard point of view for about 30 years. In about 2002, 2003, there were some researchers who began using slightly different methods to detect genetic groupings. And there's this one particular study done by Noah uh, Rosenberg at Stanford, and I, I believe it was 2002. And he came to the conclusion that you could meaningfully divide human beings into these five groups based on what he called genetic clusters or based on this overall measure of genetic similarity. And he didn't say that they corresponded to races, but a lot of people said, well, wait a minute, the five genetic groups that you've identified seem to correlate moderately well with this, at least one very traditional racial classification into black, white, Asian, American Indian, Pacific, Pacific Islander. And so that Rosenberg was not using this data to argue that races were genetically uh, real. One of the interesting things though, as you mentioned, is that the question about evolutionary foundations of racism are in some ways importantly different from the question of whether races actually exist in any kind of a biological way, because as you said, it could very well be like this. Our minds are designed to use certain kinds of social, environmental, contextual cues. Partly, uh, some of these cues might have to uh, do with a person's visual appearance, and we might use those cues to identify coalition membership. And when you put a brain that was designed like that into a modern social environment and into an, an environment specifically where racial groups are sometimes, as people put it, racialized groups are presented as coalitions that could trigger uh, that kind of in-group, out-group thinking. So as interesting as the question of the reality, biological or otherwise reality of race is, in a sense, they're two quite different topics. So I'm very curious about this idea that if you represent groups as having a strong racial identity, that that's going to automatically trigger on this evolutionary psychological account an in-group, out-group bias. So that's very curious to me because if that account is correct, then the way to resolve racist thinking in the world is to be, is to promote colorblindness. So if our media were to say, well, we're not sure races really exist. We've, we've read Justin's book and we think the critiques against the race realists are good. I'm not saying that's your account, but let's, let's just say that's what they get gather from your book. And they say, well, given all of these critiques, we think we're going to dismiss the idea of race. Don't you think that would make it more likely that there's less racism in the world? That's a great question. I don't, I don't have any deep thoughts yet about the normative implications. If, if this particular theory or another one of these evolutionary theories are true, I, ha I haven't thought deeply about where society should take that information, but there's a wonderful paper that was written about 10 years ago by Edward Mashery, Ron Mellon, and I have it here, Daniel Kelly. And it was part of this book called race and racial cognition. And it does a masterful job looking at some of the major theories uh, about racial cognition and thinking through, I think in a very tentative way, what might be some of the normative uh, implications. I think for this particular one, this coalitional theory, it wouldn't be so much, okay, well, we need to be colorblind. We need to have a colorblind society and then our, you know, evolved brains won't get triggered into being racist. I think it was the idea that they suggest, which I think is perhaps more relevant is the idea that we have to be very cautious when we present racial groups or racialized groupings as constituting coalitions, as constituting groups of people who are working closely together to achieve uh, shared ends. So one kind of question they ask is, okay, how do you disrupt those kinds of representations? How do you make sure that you separate 
coalition membership present multiracial, multi-ethnic coalitions and so on. But again, I'm not the expert in thinking through the normative implications of that particular work. But yeah, I think that's the way you might go. Yeah, that's interesting. So it seems that one could adopt either a non-racial approach, which is the colorblind approach, or it's a matter of building up affinities across racial lines. So it could be the case that you can say, well, we're all proud Democrats and some of us are Native American, some of us are white, some of us are black. And so you've got some other different coalition that supersedes the idea of the racial coalition. One of the things that you talk about in the book is when we think about certain traits that humans have biologically, we try and tell a just so story. Why do we have a particular trait? Why is this thing good for us? Why did we evolve it? Are those those sorts of just so stories that are there for the body, are they present for the mind? And is that the best way of thinking about why we've evolved certain things that it is to make us fitter or are there alternative explanations? Thank you. That is such a rich and complex question. You're really getting to the heart of some of the major uh, criticisms of evolutionary psychology. So what I think is one of the most plausible is looking at disgust, as I mentioned earlier. People all over the world tend to get disgusted by the exact same things. The smell of rotting meat, decomposing bodies, feces, finding a worm or a, a dead worm or a dead cockroach in your food when you didn't, you know, prepare it to put it there, finding it there in your food, somebody preparing food with very dirty hands. These are universally considered to be disgusting. And so there's an evolutionary hypothesis for that, which is probably pretty obvious, but sometimes it's good to stick with the obvious for a while. The evolutionary hypothesis being that the things I've just enumerated often have pathogens. And so evolution gave us the feeling of disgust so that we would keep away uh, from those kinds of things. But what's really important about this uh, hypothesis is that it's not just speculation or just so story. There's actually very, I think, firm scientific evidence suggesting that we should believe it. First of all, if, if this discussed as pathogen avoidance mechanism, if that hypothesis is true, then we should expect that people who get disgusted more easily will tend to have fewer infections. And that actually does turn out to be true. People who are easily disgusted tend to have fewer infections. Here's a second observation. If it's true, then we should expect that uh, women should be triggered a little bit more easily uh, than men's disgust uh, reaction. And that's because for the vast uh, majority of human history, women have been doing most of the very intimate child rearing. And it was particularly important that they not come into contact with pathogens and transmit those to the uh, infant. And again, that turns out to be true. So I think it's important to see that evolutionary psychology hypotheses are, again, not just so stories, they can be very firmly grounded in the data. There's been a lot of people who have written for a long time that evolutionary psychology hypotheses, you can't confirm them, you can't disconfirm them. You could never prove them. You can never disprove it. It's all just empty speculation. And I think the person who really did a lot to promote that point of view was again, Richard uh, Lewinton and his uh, frequent collaborator, Stephen J. Golden. There's a really fascinating and complicated kind of social historical background to their hostility to evolutionary approaches to the mind. So. And again, it's hard to understand the conversation today without understanding that background. So back in the 1970s, there is a biologist, E.O. Wilson. He just wrote this massive book, 1975, called Sociobiology. And he had studied insect societies. And then he decided that he finally had unlocked all the secrets of human society as well. And he looked at human society, human patterns of cooperation and competition from an evolutionary uh, point of view. So sociobiology was a, a genuine precursor to modern evolutionary uh, psychology, though there's, there's a lot of differences between them. Now, Wilson made some comments near the end of the book that were probably pretty irresponsible. What he said was that, it, and again, he didn't say it in any hard and firm, hard and fast way. But he said, maybe the wealth divide, the divide between rich and poor has more to do with genetics than with oppression and history 
and socialization. And so you can imagine people got very uh, angry with him about that. And he was saying the kinds of things that play right into the hands of social conservatives. So he was, this was back in the seventies. He was canceled. People would sh shout down his talks. Uh, somebody dumped a pitcher of cold water on his head. I mean, this has been going on for uh, a long time. So at the time, Richard Lewinton, who was one of his colleagues at Harvard, started having these meetings. Okay, clearly sociobiology is going against our project for a more inclusive, egalitarian society. How can we shut this down? And so they started writing these kind of manifestos against sociobiology and against evolutionary approaches to biology generally. So Lewinton had one called not in our genes, biology, ideology, and human nature, so something like that. Gould, of course, had the mismeasure uh, of man. And I think what happened is that around the early 90s, when evolutionary psychology really hit the scene, I think they transferred a lot of those same kinds of criticisms that they were using against sociobiology to evolutionary psychology. They had a very overtly Marxist view of, of the world, and they were very open about the fact that they felt that one of their missions as scientists was to take down dangerous patterns of theory making. And let me say one more thing about that. The core argument is one that Richard Lewinton came up with, and this is from a 98 paper called The Evolution of Cognition, Questions We'll Never Answer. And his argument went like this. In order to prove that, say, disgust evolved as a mechanism for pathogen avoidance, here's what you would have to do. You would have to prove that back in our Pleistocene ancestors, A, people varied with respect to whether they got disgusted by things or not. Two, the people who uh, got disgusted more easily had more babies than the people who didn't. And three, there's some genetic basis for it. And unless you can prove those three things, then effectively what you're saying is just speculative and untestable. You can't confirm it, uh, can't disconfirm it. Now that to me is a, is a wild and wildly inaccurate thing to say about how science works. In order for me to prove that disgust evolved as a pathogen avoidance mechanism, I don't have to get in a time machine and show you that my Pleistocene ancestors, the ones who got disgusted, had more babies, and there's a genetic component to it. All I have to show is my theory explains the data better than your theory. And that's the universal standard of science. My theory explains the data better than your theory. And I think, as I indicated earlier, that's absolutely true for the pathogen avoidance theory of disgust. So to me, I, I don't want to do these ad hominems like, oh, Richard Lewinton was just saying these things because he had the certain progressive political agenda. I, I don't want to do that. But I think that the fact that such a brilliant scientist, an accomplished scientist, and somebody I had friendly exchanges with about two years ago, super nice guy, the fact that such a brilliant and accomplished scientist said things about the nature of science that were just so wildly inaccurate, I think deserve some kind of a social historical explanation. I don't know what would, what would otherwise drive somebody to make claims like that. So I don't want to add to the, the list of wildly implausible objections <laughs> to the evolutionary psychology account, uh, but you've mentioned some examples that evolutionary psychology explains very well. I'm curious whether there's counter examples, in other words, whether there's psychological phenomena or certain mental states that people regularly experience, which evolutionary psychology can't explain well. So off the top of my head, I'm curious about states that aren't negative, but positive. So the negative states I think are going to be quite easily explained through fear of pathogens, et cetera, but the positive states are going to be more difficult. So one of them is we really like philosophy or we really like art. Why is that from an evolutionary psychological perspective? It, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, are we more likely to have children because we're on this YouTube channel or is an artist more likely to have more children? It seems not. Artists are generally quite, quite poorly or financially. So it doesn't seem to have a genetic basis. So when, when evolutionary psychologists study any particular psychological trait, like a, a love of art, there are roughly three categories of explanation that they might use. 
First, it's an adaptation. It was designed by natural selection to help us survive better or have more babies. <laughs> Two, it's a byproduct of an adaptation. Maybe our love of art has no evolutionary purpose at all. And it's just a byproduct of the fact that uh, we have some kind of a sense of beauty. Maybe the sense of beauty evolved more in the context of mating opportunity, but now we've just taken it in this fundamentally new uh, direction. And finally, there's the random genetic drift alternative, which is just, it, it's random. There's no evolutionary explanation one way or the other, like whether or not you have freckles or whether or not you have a chin cleft. I take it that that's random. It's not an adaptation, but let me say this, this is a second criticism that often goes along with the just so stories criticism. A lot of people criticize evolutionary psychology on the ground that it's what they call adaptationist. In other words, on the basis of the claim that evolutionary psychologists are biased towards seeing everything as if it's an adaptation rather than a byproduct uh, of a different adaptation. And I think that's not really uh, fair to them. I think there's a lot of cases in which evolutionary psychologists are very quick to suggest that something is in fact a byproduct of an adaptation and not an adaptation. And racism is one really great example of that. The claim isn't that racism is an adaptation because people who are racist had more babies. The claim is that it's a byproduct of a certain adaptation for detecting coalitions. And I think when it comes to philosophy, religion, our, our sense of beauty, I, I think there are a lot of different hypotheses on the table, some which we'll see in an adaptation, some which we'll see in, in, in it, a byproduct of an adaptation. Some will just see them as a product of random genetic drift. So it seems like in certain environments, it's useful to have a particular trait like pattern recognition. So if you're going through the jungle and you're very good at recognizing patterns, you're more likely to pick up whether there's a tiger lurking in the bushes versus the person who doesn't pick up the pattern. People who don't pick up the pattern get eaten more often. So the environment sort of selects for this pattern recognition. And then pattern recognition might manifest in all sorts of strange ways in our world, like being superstitious. So you uh, get into numerology because you say, well, I'm born on a certain day and that number has significance. And so all the pattern recognizers start to see patterns that don't really reflect reality. I wonder about something else, which is, are there certain morally negative traits that may have evolved? So is there an evolutionary basis for why we have things like rape? Can we explain that through, through it being a fit thing to have done in a prior environment, even though now being a rapist is the kind of thing that's not going to be very good for you. You're likely to be shunned and imprisoned, but is there some prior basis for it? As I said, when we talked about racism, I think it's really important to look at evolutionary psychology hypotheses for very ugly aspects of society, whether it's racism or sexual uh, violence. Now, rape is a very fascinating topic from the standpoint of evolutionary psychology. In some cases, they thought it was an evolved reproductive strategy for males who simply didn't have the traits that were desirable on the mating market. It was kind of nature's last ditch attempt to try to help these otherwise undesirable males to have offspring. But what's very interesting is that there's some recent evidence that tends to support the byproduct hypothesis that tends to go against the hypothesis that rape is an adaptation. And again, I would think that people who hate the hypothesis that rape is an adaptation would be pleased to know that there is some empirical evidence that the hypothesis is false. So the answer, when you hear a hypothesis like that, isn't let's shut this down right away. The answer is, well, let's see whether further empirical research actually debunks it. And there's recent research that suggests that, it, so it turns out that there's actually a negative correlation between seeing yourself as somebody who's undesirable and having any kind of a tendency toward rape. If there's a correlation at all, again, this is just some recent evidence. It's not the final word on it, but if there's a correlation at all, it seems that there's a stronger correlation between a man seeing himself or thinking of himself as desirable 
on the mating market and at least expressing a willingness to rape or having fantasies about rape. So I think that's one nice instance in which an evolutionary explanation for a very ugly trait seems to have been debunked or at least undermined by further research. But I think we should remain open to, to, to exploring these things. So a few thoughts come to mind. So the one is that it seems like the reason people might take great offense at the claim that certain phenomena are evolutionary in origin is this presupposition that a lot of people have without examining it, that what is natural is good. And the idea is that if it's evolved, it's natural. So if you say that rape is evolved, it has evolved, it's an evolutionary tray, then the idea would be that, well, rape is good. And obviously that's false. And so it gets people very worked up, but there's a few other interesting, uh, other interesting observations one could make around this. So the one is that if you take evolutionary theory very seriously and you apply it to a lot of different areas, and if you apply it to value theory as well, and you say, well, there's nothing more to something being good than that it has evolved. So if we want to explain not just our thoughts, but also the values that we think are very important from an evolutionary perspective, then you land up in this murk of this equivalence between goodness and something as having an evolutionary basis. And that seems like a problem. So I think you're absolutely right. I think, yes, it would be convenient for an evolutionary psychologist to say, well, look, you're making this traditional is ought fallacy just because something did evolve a certain way. That doesn't mean we ought to do it, but you're right. That's not a satisfying answer because suppose that, suppose that men and women cheat on their partners. And suppose that that's actually an evolved trait. There are certain situations in which men and women are inclined to cheat on their partners. And suppose that that's it. There's an evolutionary adaptation behind that. Then even though you're not saying that cheating is good or acceptable, what you seem to be saying is that it's going to be really hard to get people to stop doing that. And there does seem to be a rule. I think that it's sometimes called the ought implies can rule that you shouldn't impose these moral standards on people who really aren't able to do otherwise. And I think that's where there's a real conundrum because if you do say, say infidelity has an evolutionary is part of an evolutionary design, there are certain kind of very regular situations that will trigger that then it does suggest that you shouldn't be too hard on people for doing something that they might not actually be able to avoid doing at all. And so I think that the standpoint that the evolutionary psychologist really has to stand behind is the one that I mentioned earlier about racism. The idea is, look, if this evolutionary theory, say the coalitional theory is even in the neighborhood of being correct, this is actually absolutely vital for us to know about because it helps us see, okay, here are some situations that will tend to trigger racist thinking. Now as a society, how can we attack those, that problem? How can we try to minimize the occurrence of those kinds of situations? And that's exactly the, the point of view that at least say Randy Thornhill in this book, A Natural History of Rape was trying to develop. I don't know if he did so plausibly or implausibly, but he was trying to develop the same point of view. Look, if there is an evolutionary account of rape to be given, and if specifically it's an adaptation and there's some kind of a design story uh, behind it, we better know about this so that we can fight rape appropriately. But burying our head in the sand uh, is just gonna lead you to ineffective solutions. So I think the way he tried to get around that was to say, look, I'm on your side. I'm trying to fight sexual violence as much as anybody else. And I have these new tools, methods, theories for doing that. So in a lot of our conversation, we've been thinking about what would be good for an individual, what traits would make them fit in a certain environment. Is there evidence for the notion that distributing traits within a group would be good for the survival of that whole group? So one of the examples I'm thinking about is when you wake up in the mornings. So you have different chronotypes. Some people are locks, they get up very early in the morning. Some people are night owls like Jason and I, so we go to bed very late. And one of the arguments I've heard for why it's useful to have night owls in a society is that uh, they could keep watch against outsiders. So that is useful having someone up at four o'clock in the morning because maybe you'll get attacked at four o'clock in the morning. 
Now, it might be um, bad to be a night owl in a society that has a nine to five culture because you're, you know, getting to work what is early for you and you're tired. And so you're, you're losing out, but for the group, it would be very useful to have people like that around. I've heard a similar kind of argument for why you would have distributions of people that are homosexual on the basis that you would have additional caregivers around who aren't raising their own kids. And so they could come in as surrogate parents or additional parents. Do you think there's anything to these hypotheses? So yes, I have a, a couple chapters uh, about that in the book. Could certain traits evolve, not because they're good for me and they help me survive well and have a lot of babies, <laughs> but because they're good for the group. On average, they help the group thrive well, persist well, have a greater total reproductive output than it would otherwise. That's absolutely correct. I mean, think about worker bees uh, that are, you have these, this whole sterile cast, termites uh, as well, wasps, their whole job is to help the functioning of the hive and particularly the female worker wasps to help their sister have more offspring. So yes, clearly certain traits can evolve, not because they're good for me, uh, but because they're good for the group. And actually Darwin's major work on evolutionary psychology, the descent of man, he develops in detail, a group selectionist account of altruism says being altruistic, me giving away my resources or my time, it doesn't help me necessarily survive better, ha have more babies, but it helps my group. And that's particular that that's why it evolved in these group selection hypotheses were really buried for a big part of the 20th century in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, it became extremely unpopular to suggest that anything about the human uh, mind could have evolved by the mechanism of group selection. And in fact, if you read Richard Dawkins, uh, 1976 book, the selfish gene, I mean, he just rakes group selection over the coals. And there are some evolutionary psychologists or people oriented toward that who still have that point of view. Steven Pinker, for example, hates group selection and he just thinks it's, it's fluff, but now group selection, I think is becoming a kind of respectable mechanism again. And yes, group selection definitely comes in when you're thinking about sexual orientation and the evolution of the variation in sexual orientation from a group selectionist point of view, it may make perfect sense that some people have more of a opposite sex, sexual orientation, some people more of a same sex orientation, some people may be an asexual or pansexual sexual orientation, because it may turn out that the distribution of various forms of sexual orientation could be beneficial to the group in the long run. I mean, that's what we see among the worker bees. We see a whole cast of society that effectively takes itself out of the mating gate. I'm not claiming that that's the correct evolutionary story for variation in sexual orientation, but my point is that a group selectionist account is perfectly plausible. And there's one other thing I wanted to say about group selection, which I think is really exciting. I, as I write about madness and, and philosophy of psychiatry, and I think a lot about evolutionary aspects of mental illness. We talked about this on the show, this idea that there are certain things that we often think of as mental disorders that could actually have an evolved purpose that could have an evolved function. So depression is an example of something that may very well have to the evolve, have the evolved function of helping us to detach from unrealistic life goals. Now, when you add group selection to the mix, you get a much more kind of interesting and wider array of possible adaptationist hypotheses for things that we often think of as mental disorders. And some people have developed group selectionist accounts of autism. The idea being that cognitive variation, neurodiversity could be really beneficial from a group selectionist uh, perspective, because if you have some people who use a certain cognitive style to approach problems, another person who uses a very different cognitive style, a third person who uses a, a third distinct cognitive style, you can see how the group as a whole could solve a lot of problems and get a lot of things done. So I think to me, thinking about the intersection of group selection and, and mental illness is a really fruitful and 
potentially very subversive way of thinking about what we often describe as, as pathology. So you and Mark have discussed this uh, distinction between individual evolutionary selection versus group evolutionary selection. Um, when memes arrived on the internet, people started to wonder whether we're not just empty vessels for memes and thoughts and beliefs to evolve and to reproduce. And this, when it first arose, when I first encountered this theory, it was in the, the late 2000s, just before, I don't know how you say the late 2000s, just before 2010, but anyway, the late 2000s, I thought it was pretty crazy. Uh, now or less so, if you have a look at the way memes on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram reproduce, it's pretty amazing and they reproduce with differences. And so the same meme gets reproduced with slightly different text. It gets applied to different situations and it really does feel like it has a life of its own. I wonder whether there is a serious discussion to be had about the evolution of ideas in this way. Yeah, that's really interesting. The whole topic of memes and more generally, uh, the topic of, of cultural evolution is fascinating. I do write about that in the book, but. What's unfortunate is that the, the kind of the mainstream evolutionary psychology and cultural evolution, and particularly this kind of memetics tradition really have not engaged with one another very deeply. So yeah, there was, so one thing I did like about Richard Dawkins book, the selfish gene, this was again, 76, I think. He came up with this whole theory of memes. There are other people working on evolution, uh, cultural evolution at the time. So he does not deserve credit. And I think a lot of people got annoyed with Dawkins because they felt like he was stealing the limelight with this whole, uh, cultural evolution thing. But one, I think brilliant idea was the idea that, okay, let's think about the human mind. Let's stop thinking about natural selection, helping human beings have more babies or helping groups have more total reproductive output or whatever, let's think about the mind as a vessel for certain ideas or memes, ideas about how to tie your shoes, ideas about religion, ideas about the correct formed etiquette, ideas about how to hold a, a fork or, or spoon. Let's imagine that the mind is a big collection of these ideas and that these ideas undergo natural selection in its own right. For example, suppose I hold a, a fork in a certain way, and then I convince you that this is the right way to hold the fork. And then you convince other people and gradually this particular way of holding your fork takes over the society. That's a kind of natural selection. There's variation. Certain kinds of designs are, tend to perpetuate themselves more effectively uh, than others. But now what's perpetuating itself is something like I don't know, a bit of neural activation that tells us how to use a, a fork. So I think that yes, memetics and cultural evolution generally is a really important area. Memetics specifically hasn't been picked up to, uh, to the extent that I think that it uh, should. So these ideas were really developed by Susan Blackmore and Daniel Dennett and Dennett recently wrote, I think a very powerful response to mean critics in his book from bacteria to Bach and back. And I think it's a really useful source. Now, one thing about the idea of memes in particular, I think it's been far more controversial than it should have been. And I was talking to Dennett about this and I think he's absolutely right that there's a kind of socio historical explanation for why so many cultural theorists hate the idea of memes and memetics. And it goes back to these turf wars. It was 1976. Dawkins says, I have this brilliant idea. It's memes. Everything's about memes. There are a lot of cultural evolutionists who are working around that same time and developing similar ideas. Okay. Clearly there's something or other that human beings are passing down to one another, something of a more of a behavior or an idea or way of doing things. And I think that they were upset that Dawkins kind of rushed in and coined this term and got a lot of fame for it. And so a lot of cultural theorists, cultural evolutionists said, okay, Dawkins memes, interesting, cute idea, Dawkins, uh, but it's fundamentally wrong or incomplete or inaccurate or misguided. My theory really is the one that you want to be 
looking at. So yes, the, the, the idea of memetics, I think, got unfairly criticized. And I think it was largely criticized because of these academic turf wars. And we all know these turf wars just as well as anybody else. When you come up with a great idea and then somebody else comes up with a great idea that's kind of similar to your great idea, they're the person you're going to attack most and say, well, they, they got it wrong. That's, I think that's what happened to memes. So there's this account on intelligence called the greater male variance thesis. So the idea is that when you look on average between men and women, they wind up on average as having the same IQ, but the idea is the distributions are different. So you get more very dumb men and more very brilliant men and that women on the curve kind of are more towards the center. So firstly, is there any evidence to support the notion? And secondly, this seems like one of these group traits. So is there any evolutionary explanation we could have for why you would have these different kinds of distribution of intelligence between men and women? Wow. So you've really latched on to a huge question in evolutionary psychology. And really the, the big question has to do with, are there evolved psychological sex differences? Generally, evolutionary psychologists like to look at what's common to everybody, discussed mechanisms, but we should also expect that males and females will differ in certain systematic ways when it comes to things such as mating, reproduction, and parenting, because of our, our biologies effectively impose these different kinds of demands upon us. So the evolutionary psychologist, and I think they're right infers that males and females probably differ in certain kinds of ways when it comes to the way that they think about things, their attitudes. Now, I don't know anything about the, the intelligence variation hypothesis or about the mathematical abilities, but I certainly uh, think that there, there would be some psychological differences between men and women. And some are very predictable, and I don't think that they're very controversial. So for example, men tend to be more indiscriminate sexually than women. Men tend to be more willing to have sex with somebody after a very short time than women are. And this is, you go all over the world and you see this exact same pattern. Men are more willing to have sex with somebody after a short period of time. They fantasize about sex more often. They're, they're far more likely to solicit prostitutes. I mean, it just goes on and on. This I, I think would be a plausible example of an evolved psychological difference between males and, and, um, and females. But I think one theme that's been getting a lot of play recently, and, and I think is very exciting is the idea that in some cases, psychological differences between males and females could have the following character. There could be very small innate differences between men and women that are then amplified by society. And I think that's one way in which kind of an exciting area where evolutionary psychology and socialization intermesh in complex ways. And my, my favorite example, there's a book by Lise Elliott, and I think it's called Pink Brains, Blue Brains. And the whole theme of this book is that we should look clearly at, at, at the way in which small innate differences become amplified by socialization practices. And one nice example that she uses is this. There's some evidence that girls appear to be innately more verbal than boys. In terms of developmental milestones, girls start talking at a younger age and girls master more words than boys at about comparable ages. Now let's suppose that that's true. Let's suppose that there is some kind of an innate difference between boys and girls in terms of their verbal ability. Then you could imagine the following scenario playing out. You could imagine that the girl's caretakers, parents, guardians, just take more pleasure in talking uh, to the girl than to the boy because she has things to say. She's interesting to talk to. And so through that, they might get a lot more face-to-face -face time, a lot more interaction, and they're going to be learning a lot more about human social dynamics than men are. And it could be by, by the time that they're five years old, six years old, 
seven year, years old, they are experts at socialization. They understand how to interact well with other people where the boys, because of their lower verbal ability at birth, simply didn't have those same kinds of opportunities. And so that'd be one nice example and neat differences getting blown up by socialization practices, even socialization practices that we're completely unaware of. And again, this is one of these areas, which if it's true, it is extremely important for developmental psychology. It is extremely important for education to know uh, that because of these small innate differences, we may be inclined to treat boys and girls slightly differently. And those differences could turn out to have really powerful consequences later in life. Men and women seem to be comparable, say, in terms of mathematical abilities. That's one thing that comes up a lot. I think it was 2005, Lawrence Summers, who was then president of Harvard University, made this, again, I think very irresponsible suggestion, speculation. It was in a closed door meeting that perhaps there are more males in STEM disciplines than females because males neatly have a greater mathematical aptitude. And from what I know that that's absolutely been debunked. There's a book called Brain Gender by Melissa Hines. I was written back in, you know, early 2000s, but I think it goes systematically through these kinds of findings. When it comes to mathematical ability, her claim is that there's no significant differences between men and women. Again, another reason why, yes, it was inappropriate for him to make those kinds of claims, but instead of shooting down research, on differences in mathematical aptitude, why not continue exploring it? Because it may turn out later that gets completely debunked. And then we could say, okay, good. There's no real differences between men and women mathematically. And we're saying that because we have evidence and not because we've been bullied you know, or silenced. We say that because that's what the best science is telling us. It seems like one of the consistent observations that you've made in this discussion, which I agree with is it seems like we need to pursue the science rather than ignore science that we don't want to be true. And sometimes there'll be unexpected benefits to that. So it might turn out that what we want to be true is true, but we better be sure before we just proclaim any counter evidence to be false because it's racist or misogynistic or homophobic or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I agree entirely. I would add to that. I agree with what you said, and I would add more to that. Not only should scientists bravely pursue truth, even if it's unpopular, but scientists, I think, also have a responsibility in the kind of topics they pursue, in the way that they communicate, in the way that they speculate openly about things where, where there's no evidence at all. I think scientists really have an obligation, particularly when they're getting into these complex ideas of, of, of race, sexual violence, differences between uh, males and females. I think it's also important that they remain very sensitive to the social and political repercussions of simply theorizing about things, of simply speculating about things. That has consequences that I think they need to be aware of as well. So yeah, I think scientists absolutely need to take on this kind of balance between truth seeking and, and cautiousness and how they communicate.